actually one of my favorite topics to cover in sports medicine, and obviously it has to do with bracing. So um, <clears throat> it's an area I've really kept up on and uh, maintained a long-term interest. So I want to share with you what I've learned over the years and what are some new insights. So let's see if I can get this to move. This is really the cornerstone of this lecture, um, preventing uh, this long-term sequela of the neglected ankle sprain, degenerative arthritis of the ankle joint. Some of you may not realize there is a connection, but we're gonna talk about that now. Most of you are aware that the ankle sprain is the most common injury in sport. About 25,000 people a day in the United States experience an acute ankle sprain that requires medical attention. What I'm gonna emphasize in the first part of the lecture is the fact that we mismanage these sprains. The ankle sprain does have the highest rate of recurrence compared to all other injuries in sport. Uh, for example, individuals who have an ankle sprain have a twofold increased risk of re-injury within a year of their initial injury. There is actually a 98% probability of an ankle sprain recurrence within one year in popular youth sports such as soccer and basketball. It, it's interesting to look at uh, when we look at youth sports and the risk factor for ankle sprains, it, it might surprise you that the number one sport is basketball followed by gymnastics, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of people think soccer has such a high rate of ankle sprains, but it actually ranks behind football. And depending on whether you're a boy or a girl, volleyball, may or may not be as risky as, for example, soccer. Uh, girls who play vol volleyball have a significantly less chance of spraining their ankle than when they play soccer. Softball is the least dangerous sport, uh, particularly for girls. What, what really happens though, unfortunately with ankle sprains is that 40% of patients go on and suffer and develop this syndrome, which is called chronic ankle instability. Many studies have shown that chronic ankle instability, once it sets in, will last for years. And it basically is describing a syndrome of, of functional impairment. Uh, it's an impairment based on the proprioception, the sensory motor system, and residual structural instability of the ankle. And, re and recently, it's been all related to the development of ankle post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So chronic ankle instability is not just a weak ankle in terms of loss of ligamentous stability. It also has a, as much or more important um, causative factor in a deficit of neuromuscular control. A loss of ligamentous stability can be detected with manual testing, the most popular being the anterior drawer test, which is highly specific uh, for ligamentous disruption particularly the anterior talofibular ligament. The loss of neuromuscular control is something a little more vague for clinicians to detect. And it's much more than just a loss of proprioception. It's a loss of, of muscle strength and muscle activation when the foot or the ankle is placed in a precarious position and the activation of a protective mechanism. The reason so many people, up to 70%, who suffer an ankle sprain go on to chronic ankle instability is because the injury is mismanaged. When patients go to an emergency room, the primary focus is taking x-rays to rule out fracture, and often the patients leave simply with a prescription for pain relieving medication. Often the patients fall under the care of treating physicians who have failed to keep abreast of newer insights into the treatment and the rehabilitation of the ankle sprain. And finally, clinicians are constantly returning athletes to sport far before they've adequately restored range of motion, strength, balance, and neuromuscular control. And that's probably why there's a 98% chance of re-injury within one year. But this is something new that we're discovering, and that is that 40% of patients who suffer a significant ankle sprain will go on to develop some level of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. 
Now it's interesting that primary osteoarthritis is relatively rare in the ankle. It is common in the knee, hand, and hip joints, the so-called wear and tear uh, on healthy people as they age, wearing out the cartilage. The ankle joint doesn't experience primary osteoarthritis. When patients get arthritis in the ankle, it's usually due to trauma. About 90% of ankle osteoarthritis is associated with severe ankle sprains. When we look at trauma causing arthritis, the ankle is the most common site of the lower extremity. It's not wear and tear, it's trauma. And as I just said, 90% of it's due to an ankle sprain. 50% of patients who have post-traumatic osteoarthritis of the ankle joint and look back to a single event, a single ankle sprain that occurred many years earlier. It, the average onset of post-traumatic osteoarthritis in patients mm -hmm. is over the age of 50. But research has shown it takes about 26 years to develop post-traumatic osteoarthritis after a single severe lateral ankle sprain. And so one of the problems here are younger patients who experience an ankle sprain and they go on in life and move to, from doctor to doctor. And the initial treating doctor never knows the failure of that initial treatment of the ankle sprain in the young adolescent athlete. A new study has shown residual instability in young athletes after only one ankle sprain. This is an interesting survey of uh, younger patients three to 15 years after their initial ankle sprain. This was a, a study of 86 participants with a median age of 23 years who were followed about eight years after having a single ankle sprain. And then they were followed afterward. What was found is that these patients had pain symptoms and reduced participation in sport with lower ankle-related quality of life uh, scoring compared to uninjured controls that lasted three to 15 years after one single injury. This has really prompted a call to action by clinicians and researchers around the world to try to come together and find a better formula to treat ankle sprains and prevent reoccurrence. In 2016, a consensus statement was published by a consortium of experts looking at the long-term and uh, long-term consequences of lateral ankle sprains, particularly the development of arthritis. One of the first things the panel did was evaluate the biology of healing ankle ligaments and looking at how quickly we're returning athletes to sport. Ankle ligaments are no different than other ligaments in the body. And Many of us were schooled in this in school as far as uh, wound healing, bone healing, ligament healing. And we should be reminded that it takes up to 12 months until final maturation and remodeling occurs of a ruptured ligament anywhere in the body. <clears throat> in studies done in the laboratory with mal uh, mouse models, for example, where they take mice, sever the ligaments and monitor healing time, it is found that in, in this particular study, even at 12 months, the injured ligament had only retained 80% of its original strength, 12 months. Based on the basic science research, a grade two or grade three ankle sprain must be protected to allow proper healing for a period of at least six months. What do we do in, uh, in the real world? This is an interesting study done in the NC2A. These are uh, level uh, one uh, collegiate athletes where a survey around the country back in 2002 showed that we return an athlete to sport six weeks after a grade three ankle sprain. And the more common grade two ankle sprain, the average return to play is only 12 days. Obviously, based on the basic science of ligament healing, it's an impending disaster for the athlete. This lesson hasn't been learned. I, 
uh, gave this lecture a year ago at the Western Podiatry Congress, just after the NC2A finals. Um, and that year um, uh, in the finals, University of North Carolina's star, Armando Baycott, had played in the final game on an, an on an ankle that he had injured one week earlier in the uh, semifinals. And he said basically that, that he was ready to play in the final game six days after a severe sprain. He said his ankle was a little sore and a little swollen, but there was no way he wasn't going to play in this game. And it, it's easy to understand that this is the dream of a lifetime. If you watch that game in the final quarter, watch his right ankle as he approaches the basket. Suffers a severe re-sprain, has to be taken out of the game and can't finish the game. So in spite of his will and determination to play, that ankle in no way was recovered and stable to play at that level. So basically, if we look at return to play decision making, it's still a big problem, particularly in younger athletes. This was an article published in 2014, uh, which was a prospective study during a high school season in the Midwest. And it was a survey of uh, several thousand high school athletes. Uh, to determine how quickly they were sent back to play after an ankle sprain. And surprisingly, and almost shockingly, the median return to play for high school athletes in that season was one to three days, regardless of the injury history. And again, there is no way that ankle is even close to being ready to return to sport. So following the, uh, the basic science of ligament healing, we get some ideas of how long we need to protect an ankle and rehabilitate an ankle to let ligaments heal before they get uh, fully strengthened and allow full function. We are understanding this delicate balance between strict immobilization and mobilization with functional rehabilitation. There is still good evidence that a short period of immediate and strict immobilization for one to two days after a severe ankle sprain is the preferred treatment. But there reaches a point at about week four, at least, that we do not want to do strict immobilization. And some people avoid strict immobilization after even one week, as long as there is some form of protected immobilization used. For example, the Standard protocol in most universities is using removable external supports, including taping or bracing after uh, day 10, depending on the disability of the athlete. Now, one exception to this is the so-called high ankle sprain, the syndesmotic injury to the ligaments at the anterior aspect of the ankle. That has a different mechanism of injury and it has a different anatomic location of ligamentous failure. If you wanna remember the mechanism, remember this picture of a skier catching, in this case, the left ski on the, um, on, on the uh, gate of a slalom course, causing the ankle to rapidly externally rotate. So contrary to lateral ankle sprains, the syndesmotic sprain, high ankle sprain, the foot is in a dorsiflex position and the foot is moved into external rotation. I have a sequence provided to me by a patient of mine who was an NFL photographer on the field of the uh, an NFL playoff game when Ben Roethlisberger or the um, Pittsburgh Steelers went down with a severe high ankle sprain. And here is the mechanism, dorsiflexed ankle and severe external rotation applied to the foot, usually with the impact of a large, in this case, defensive lineman. So if the ankle doesn't fracture, the syndesmotic ligaments definitely get injured. We saw a similar mechanism of injury in the NFL playoffs uh, last season with uh, Patrick Mahomes. It's very similar. The ankle is pinned to the ground, alignment is falling on the foot and ankle, and the foot is externally rotated. 
in this case, severe stress placed on the medial collateral of the knee, as well as the syndesmotic ligaments of the ankle. This ankle sprain is treated differently, usually with strict immobilization with the foot in a slightly plantar flex position because these ligaments are so fragile and take so long to heal and they don't do well with weight bearing and particularly with motion. So in the high ankle sprain, many times there's a short period of casting with the ankle plantar flexed and internally rotated to reverse the mechanism of the injury. And then a prolonged period of protected immobilization in a walking boot or perhaps a functional brace like the Ritchie brace. We have really had good results with the Ritchie brace on high ankle sprains because it has a foot plate and the foot, foot plate can control external rotation of the foot at the ankle joint. Let's not forget that functional rehabilitation is the cornerstone of recovery from an ankle sprain. It's a program that is often neglected or never instituted, particularly in younger patients. And yet it is the essential part of restoring not only proprioception and strength, but also helping the ligament itself heal. There is no consensus when to initiate exercises after an ankle sprain, but most evidence Im indicates implementing sooner is better than later. Patients should do both concentric and eccentric exercise, preferably under the supervision of a qualified rehabilitation specialist and later progressing to home therapy. And most qualified experts begin proximal at the hip and work down with strength and balance and proprioceptive str uh, str strengthening. The average rehabilitation program takes at least eight weeks and preferably 12 weeks. A newer approach involves joint mobilization. And while this used to be somewhat uh, condemned, it is now almost universally accepted where a skilled clinician will mobilize or even manipulate the ankle, particularly relocating the talus into a more posterior position and also uh, stabilizing the calcaneus under the talus. So joint mobilization should be included, particularly in the early phase of rehabilitation. And balance training, often neglected, but a, a, a very important part of the program and something that can be carried out by the patient in the home setting and really has to be done on a daily basis to be effective and has to be done for a minimum of eight to 12 weeks. Of all of the interventions for treating an ankle sprain, balance training received the highest level of evidence and support by the National Athletic Trainers Association expert panel. There are many, many papers published in the literature and studies documenting the benefits of balance training to help rehabilitate the ankle and prevent the reoccurrence of an ankle sprain. Something you should all keep in mind is that there's a lot of really cool gadgets on the uh, market available on the internet that patients can purchase and use in the home setting with proper education and perhaps initial supervision where they can now spend five to 10 minutes every day on their own balance training. And they can do this while working at a stand-up desk. They can do it while brushing their teeth in the bathroom anything that reminds them to do it on a daily basis. The research shows that 10 minutes a day is all that's necessary over a 12 week period to store functional stability to the ankle with balanced training. There are many protocols and uh, uh, landmark steps that are used to progress a patient out of rigid immobilization during the first seven days and then moving them into a, an ankle brace. But you don't simply move them out of a boot and have them start walking. Protected mobilization is necessary for a minimum of 21 days after a grade two to grade three ankle sprain. It is not unusual for a patient after an ankle sprain to require three immobilizing devices, starting with a walking boot, to a uh, articulated foot plate ankle brace, and finally returning to sport often in a soft brace 
or a figure of eight brace. The Ritchie brace has a variety of braces that can be um, uh, implemented during this protocol, starting with an articulated foot plate off the shelf brace, not a custom brace. This is what we call the OTC brace. And this is an excellent device to transition a patient into after moving them out of a walking boot. It has the advantage, just like the Ritchie brace, of allowing pure sagittal plane motion across the ankle joint while in inhibiting uh, an un unnecessary inversion, eversion, or external rotation. Some patients, as I will show you later, may require moving into a custom brace for long-term management when they have significant foot deformity or when they are returning to a sport with a high risk of re-injury. Some patients benefit from the additional uh, benefits of a lateral arch suspender, which is a powerful tool to prevent inversion of the ankle, much like a high die strapping or J strap that an athletic trainer will implement. So these are basic guidelines that I've just reviewed where we must respect the fact that um, it, it, for at least three months, none of these ligaments have healed after an ankle sprain and some protection must be provided. And then becomes the dilemma of should they wear the brace when they return to sport? And there is convincing evidence that ankle braces will prevent recurrent sprains in athletes who have suffered a previous sprain when they return to sport. As many of you know, numerous studies have shown that taping is less effective in preventing a sprain than our, our uh, off-the-shelf ankle braces. Once again, uh, many systematic reviews have been published showing that the most important uh, risk group are patients who have suffered a previous ankle sprain. And if they wear a, a, a off-the-shelf brace, it doesn't have to be an expensive brace, they have a 70% less chance of having a recurrent sprain. There is no end point to suggest when an athlete can discontinue prophylactic bracing. In my opinion, reading all the literature after a grade two or grade three sprain, all athletes should wear a preventive brace for at least one year after the initial injury. So what is this evidence? These are the early papers published back in the early 90s. But since that time, many papers, including systematic reviews, have continued to show that there is good evidence that even simple lace-up ankle braces will prevent recurrent sprains in athletes when they return to sport. In terms of specific sports, here are some of the papers that are published, and you can review these yourself at another time if you uh, wish to do so. But I wanted to show you two of the best studies, and these are really eye-opening. And they were both performed by Timothy McGuine um, uh, over 10 years ago, and they're both remarkable studies. They were performed um, in the Midwest area on high school athletes. And as I'm about to show you, they're very impressive studies. High school athletes are of most interest for us because they are at high risk for sprain. And they are the ones who, when neglected, will go on and develop osteoarthritis 30 years later. There's a high incidence of ankle sprains in high school athletes in all sports. So the first study that McGuine did was on high school, uh, high school male basketball players. And look at these numbers. He recruited 1,460 uh, correct male and female players from 46 high schools, and he followed them through an entire season. They were randomly assigned to either wear preventive braces or not wear them. It had nothing to do with whether they had a previous history of a sprain. The ankle brace that was used in this basketball study was a very simple lace-up brace that's available on the internet. <clears throat> this brace was made by McDavid. And the findings were quite startling. <clears throat> if we compare the control group to the braced group, 
we see that the number of ankle injuries was less than half in the uh, high school students who wore a brace. Less than half uh, in, in high school basketball. They found that the overall incidence of ankle, all ankle injuries was reduced by three times if they wore a brace. And more importantly, or as an incidental finding, there was no increased risk of knee injuries in the athletes who wore a brace. So wearing a brace does not increase the risk of knee injuries. That's a big myth in sports medicine. McGuine went on and studied high school football players in a very similar fashion. This was another randomized level one study. And this brace was slightly different. It was a Don Joy stabilizer brace figure of eight design with Velcro straps and lace up. He recruited over 1,000 uh, athletes to follow him through a high school football season. And again, found a remarkable reduction in rate of injury, 61% reduced incidence of ankle sprains in athletes who wore a lace up brace. So in, in summary, in both these studies, the incidence of injury was almost twofold in both cases, some cases threefold greater in those high school athletes who did not wear a preventive brace. In conclusion, the use of a lace up ankle brace in football and basketball reduced the incidence of injury of ankle sprains. It was found in both those athletes who had a previous history and no history of ankle sprain. It did not affect the severity of the sprain, which is interesting. We can talk about that later, but it also did not increase the risk of knee injuries in both sports. Now, in that paper, McGuine showed what the cost savings would be if we put every high school athlete in a preventive brace. If we just look at high school football alone, in his cohort, of a thousand athletes. He estimated the cost of taping an athlete, one athlete for an entire season is between 40 and $60. The cost of that simple lace up ankle brace is $30. The bracing will reduce the number of ankle sprains in the entire country. If we look at uh, the total number of athletes playing football, McGuire estimated that we would prevent about 40,000 ankle sprains. The cost of treating that many ankle sprains of all the ankle sprains in the country exceeds 40 million. So um, <clears throat> basically the cost of an ankle injury in high school football is a, uh, in that cohort was $12,000 <clears> in that entire cohort, not per athlete. And reducing the number of uh, sprains just with ankle bracing in his estimate in the entire country would save $340 million. Now those skeptics who object to preventive ankle bracing or bracing period in athletes, I wanna go through some of the, the arguments that you will hear from coaches, athletic trainers, and parents who may be in your clinic or office and object to you bracing the athlete. The first is uh, cost, when we've just discussed how much money that can actually save. And then we're gonna go through some other factors. So just looking at tape versus bracing, um, and I kind of alluded to this, bracing is far less expensive than taping. And bracing an athlete saves money in the long-term cost of recurrent sprain, and bracing is far less expensive than taping. It's about three times uh, less expensive than taping. Here's the big one, and I hear this even from skilled, knowledgeable physical therapists who say, I don't, want, I don't want them to wear a brace too long because it's gonna weaken their ankle. It's gonna make the athlete more reliant on the brace for stability and function. That is absolutely not true. And if you look in the literature, you will see some compelling research about this. And I welcome anybody to look at these papers in detail. 
This was a paper um, published in the Journal of Athletic Training by Cordova et al. And where they used uh, um, electrodes and electromyography on athletes with lace up and air cast. An air cast would be the semi rigid brace. And they measured the activation of the per perineal muscles. And they found that after eight weeks of use of a brace, there was no decreased activation of those particular muscles at all. They found that, that the perineal stretch reflex was not facilitated or inhibited with extended use of any external support. And so uh, there was no compromise of feedback and activation. Another study published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine on activation of the perineals uh, with various types of ankle braces, looking at the stretch reflex. And they found that the stretch reflex actually was enhanced with use of ankle bracing. That the initial aspect, uh, the initial application of a brace actually facilitated a greater amplitude of muscular response. There was greater muscular activation when the athlete wore the brace when the athlete did not wear the brace. Another study published in the Journal of Athletic Training comparing stiffness or muscular activation around the ankle joint complex, wearing two different types of ankle braces. Wearing the brace increased stiffness of the ankle joint compared to the non-brace condition. So the idea of a brace weakening the ankle is not only not true, these studies show there's actually greater muscular activation, probably from proprioceptive feedback and the athletes actually generate greater stiffness around the ankle joint when they wear the brace. Some people think that wearing an ankle brace actually affects postural control and balance when actually the opposite is found in studies of athletes wearing ankle braces. There are many studies showing favorable improvements of proprioception, balance and postural control when wearing any type of ankle brace compared to the non-brace condition. These are 10 papers uh, alone uh, summarizing some of this research. And finally, and you will get this not only from the coach, but you'll get this from the athlete themselves. I don't wanna wear a brace because it's gonna inhibit my performance. This has also been studied in detail and the results are, are quite interesting. If we look at 17 randomized controlled trials using crossover design, measuring the effects of ankle bracing and compared to the non-brace condition and also compared to tape in both injured and uninjured subjects, here's what we find. In terms of sprint speed, the largest negative effect was with lace-up braces, and yet it only yielded a 1% impairment. Now lace-up braces have the disadvantage of completely locking the ankle in a dorsiflexed position and they inhibit plantar flexion. So that's why you might see a slight reduction of sprint speed. For agility tests like figure of eight and shuttle runs, et cetera, and cutting, the negative effect of any type of ankle brace was only 0.5%. For vertical jump, a 1% decrease in performance was found in both tape, an air cast, and lace-up ankle braces. The authors concluded that the negative effects are trivial. They may have significance for ultra elite athletes, but certainly not for the high school athlete. Whereas the benefit of external ankle support in preventing injury outweighs the small negative effect on sports performance. Now there is a concern with this use of figure of eight ankle bracing, particularly in sagittal plane motion across the ankle in sports where um, jumping is the primary performance measure. This is a more recent paper published um, uh, from Canada with high level volleyball players, collegiate level volleyball players using a lace up ankle brace. And indeed they found compared to the no brace condition that there was a reduction in vertical jump of about one centimeter. Now, while that might seem trivial, the 
the authors of the study thought that that could make a difference at this high level, particularly in uh, getting blocked at the net with uh, someone going up to spike the ball and actually only getting up, uh, well, one centimeter less than they would without the brace. But these were lace-up braces with a figure of eight design. Another study on figure of eight ankle braces uh, showed, and I'll just read the fine print, that there was restriction in vertical jump and standing long jump that was statistically significant compared to the non-brace condition. So in long jump and sports with vertical jumping, lace-up braces may not be the preferred brace. And this kind of brings me to some of the benefits of the Ritchie brace because our brace is fully hinged anatomically at the ankle joint axis. From day one, we advocated positioning the subtalar joint in neutral and marking the uh, athlete or the patient at the ankle joint so that we could place the hinges exactly according to their own ankle joint axis to provide free unrestricted sagittal plane motion. Research has shown that the ankle joint axis varies from individual to individual and that it's determined by the tips of the malleoli. And the position of the malleoli both from the ground and from the transverse plane varies from patient to patient. With the Ritchie brace, we place it exactly according to that patient's anatomic hinge. And therefore, we believe we can provide unrestricted pure sagittal plane motion. So we mark the malleolus for every casting and we place the hinge appropriately. And for that reason, and th this is actually an athlete with a mild drop foot, <clears throat> and we place them in a Ritchie brace with a dynamic hinge. You can see the obvious limp in this patient due to the weakness and drop foot. We put him in the Ritchie brace properly placed and he has an absolutely normal gait. He's got this brace inside a pair of court shoes and this particular patient plays tennis three times a week, totally uninhibited uh, with his Ritchie brace. The foot orthotic portion of the Ritchie brace is also very important for uh, chronic ankle instability. Many years ago, well, in 2007, I published this article summarizing the effect of foot orthoses alone on patients with chronic ankle instability. And in that paper, I reviewed all of this research of how just foot orthotics improve balance, uh, particularly in athletes who have had ankle sprains. It's quite interesting and already discovered in the uh, athletic training in industry or uh, profession, how important foot orthotics can be for chronic ankle instability. Since I wrote my paper, numerous other papers have been published chronicalizing and documenting the effects of foot orthotics to stabilize the ankle. There are many theories why foot orthotics alone improve ankle stability, but not the least of which is the effect of foot orthotics on patients with cavus feet. For some reason, cavus feet seem to be more prone to ankle sprain, partly because less of the foot is actually on contact on the ground for support and proprioception but also because they tend to have varus alignment of the hind foot. And so this is already the perfect storm for an inversion ankle sprain. Many of us intuitively know how to use foot orthotics to correct hind foot alignment simply with a foot orthotic. And then uh, with a foot orthotic alone, perhaps preventing the ankle sprain. The Ritchie brace contains a custom functional foot orthotic that can be balanced and posted just like a standard foot orthotic, but with the additional benefit of the upright supports to prevent medial and lateral torque across the ankle joint. So we cast or scan for the Ritchie brace in a non-weight bearing position, just like we do for a custom foot orthotic. And then we correct the cast to balance the hind foot to perpendicular. And that alone provides stability to the ankle joint. We balance the cast intrinsically with, with posting for the Ritchie brace, just as we do with the root functional foot orthotic. 
and therefore we can correct a rear foot varus to perpendicular. And because the brace is custom contoured, it fits the foot and the ankle. And if the foot and ankle fit in the shoe, the brace will fit in the shoe. And so the Ritchie brace is less likely to disrupt shoe fit than any off the shelf brace because it's custom molded to the contours of the ankle and the foot. That's why a Ritchie brace will fit better into a cleat than most other types of braces. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump ahead because I'm kind of running out of time and I might come back and uh, talk about some of the pearls you can also do with a foot orthotic, but I wanna end with just some uh, great anecdotal evidence of what we've done uh, with the Ritchie brace. And um, particularly in, a, in a, a very unfortunate injury that some athletes will suffer um, that's not directly an ankle sprain. Uh, this is our dynamic assist brace, which we are using a lot on injured athletes who have undergone a severe knee dislocation. And this is exactly what happens, a severe dislocation of the knee, tearing uh, the anterior cruciate, sometimes posterior cruciate, but also due to the severe hyperextension, causing a traction injury to the common perineal nerve. This is Jalon Smith playing in the uh, Fiesta Bowl during his senior year at the University of Notre Dame when he was the number one rated linebacker in the country scheduled to be drafted either number one or number two in the NFL draft. He suffered a severe dislocation of his knee in the final game of the season and suffered a drop foot as a result of the common perineal nerve injury. And so many NFL teams passed on him because he literally had a drop foot after having his knee stabilized surgically, he had a residual drop foot that inhibited severely his performance. And his athletic trainer put him in a Ritchie brace. And this was a, a picture from the Dallas Cowboys website. And he trained during the preseason wearing our dynamic assist brace, despite the fact he had a significant passive drop foot deformity. The brace fit well into his cleat, and there was a lot of social media generated about this. The starting linebacker for the Dallas Cowboys was injured in the preseason, and Jalon Smith actually became a starter as a rookie and played as a starter the entire season. It's hard for you to tell, but he's wearing a Richie brace here in this picture. Uh, the trainers tape over the brace because uh, they uh, the brace, um, it's potentially dangerous to uh, opposing players to catch their hands or fingers on the brace itself. Here's a picture of Jalon running in the brace. Oh. And if you think an, uh, yeah. uh, a brace can uh, inhibit uh, athletic performance, take yeah. a look at this video because it's clearly not affecting any part of his performance. After that season, he was given a long-term contract with the Dallas Cowboys, and better yet, he was able to abandon his Ritchie brace because the common perineal nerve finally recovered. If you're watching the NFL or the NBA playoffs right now, uh, Michael Porter Jr., a star for the Denver Nuggets, started his rookie season with a drop foot deformity after a lumbar laminectomy in his senior year of college. He wore the Ritchie brace during his rookie season and also happily moved out of the brace and he's brace free today and performing at, as you know, an extremely high level uh, with a fantastic team that likely will win the NBA title this year. So hopefully that's piqued your interest in the benefits of bracing athletes, the pros and cons, most of which are pros. And I look forward to talking with you more if any of you have questions. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, I'm here. Yes. All right. <laughs> can you hear me? I can. Perfect. All right. So um, we have a couple questions. And so uh, I definitely encourage everybody who's, who has stayed with us to ask any questions. Now is the time. So let's get 
go in here when pre when prescribing <laughs> when prescribing the aero spring and insurance doesn't cover the L3000 portion you had mentioned using OTC orthotics and send them with the cast how does that work when how does that work and which OTC would you recommend oh that's a great question um i don't um, I don't know that I've recommended sending the OTC orthotic with the cast, um, except if the practitioner wants us to uh, perhaps Velcro the orthotic to the top of the aerospring foot plate. But otherwise, there's no need to send us the uh, OTC device. Um, you know, a proven OTC over the years is uh, Superfeet, and another proven one is Power Step. Um, I like both of those because they're full length, and I think you need a full length OTC with a, a nice top cover and padded extension, particularly for sport, and particularly because the AeroSpring has a carbon fiber foot plate, and you need definitely a layer of padding on top of that. When would you find it more appropriate to use the standard Richie brace versus the AeroSpring? Um, well, keep in mind the AeroSpring is not a hinged. Uh, brace. It's a carbon fiber AFO, and it's really designed to use a ground reaction force to uh, replace weak muscles, uh, particularly a drop foot case. Um, we also, as you know, use it to offload the plantar fascia um, and the midfoot joints for arthritis. It would not be my go-to brace at all for uh, ankle sprain. Um, I prefer a hinged brace like the Ritchie brace, not a restricted carbon fiber brace. Um, I would say for an athlete who perhaps has a combination with drop foot uh, with weakness of the perineals and the uh, posterior musculature, maybe the aero spring could be used in the early part, but that's certainly a more unusual uh, presentation. I would tend to go with the dynamic assist or the standard Ritchie brace for most athletes for long-term treatment of chronic ankle instability. I just have to, <laughs> this reminded me, I was, I was just out and about a couple of days ago and a gal had a walking boot on and she's like, I haven't been able to drive in however long. And I was just like, what am I going to say? But yeah. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, you know, there's something that you can use that can you still drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, price, Richie Brace costs, both OTC and custom. Big difference. Um, the OTC brace um, is about, and I hate quoting this, but I'm glad you brought it up. If you look at this slide, these are all the authorized distributors of the Ritchie brace, and all of them have uh, uh, you can access to get the exact cost to the practitioner for any of our braces. But just to give you a ballpark, the OTC brace is about $60 to $70, don't quote me. And the custom Richie brace is um, uh, about $300. Are you there, Sarah? Sorry, <laughs> I had myself muted and hid. I was having a personal malfunction. Um, okay. <laughs> all right well those are honestly you, your presentation must have just been <laughs> and you got everything answered because those are the only questions that came through so um you can hang out here for another couple of seconds i will i, I can show my screen as well uh just to give everybody a quick heads up as to where you can find the recording of oh we got another one here we go do you make the custom or are do you do you make the custom ones or are there, are there trainer or do the trainers? Not really. I, I don't oh, know. hmm. Well, um, the provider of the Richie brace could be a podiatrist, a podorthist, a uh, athletic trainer, um, anybody who's been uh, properly trained to take a cast of the foot and ankle can order a Richie brace um from us um i'm not sure i understand the question can yeah i was gonna say is there any way you can um let me get back to the screen here i was bopping around 
Oh, okay. I misunderstood. I said you train others. Well, we, you know, we do webinars um, uh, for the Ritchie Brace, as you know, we've done several for, um, for the Practice Academy with podiatrymeetings.com. And our website is full of information. Um, and we have videos on how to cast, which is, and how to scan. Uh, those are the real essentials. But, you know, custom AFO bracing is really a specialty. And it's done by, um, you know, people who do this. It's mainly podiatrists. Uh, it's orthotists, uh, podorthists. Um, you know, I do get physical therapists occasionally call me and say they want to uh, implement a Ritchie brace. And I ask them if they've ever casted a patient for a foot orthosis. And they say no. And I say, well, generally, you need to have a certain skill set for that before getting into AFO bracing. Not that a, a physical therapist can't learn how to do it. Uh, I have great confidence in them, but there may be some specialized training. Uh, any podiatrist who's trained in casting for foot orthotics can cast for a Ritchie brace. It's no different. So there's no specialized training needed for those people who have already been schooled in foot orthotic uh, therapy. And just a quick note, so on the website, you can see there are a lot of casting videos and training videos with Dr. Ritchie. We also have the fitting guides, which are very helpful. Um, and then the next question that just came through, I'm going to take us over to our billing and coding resources because this says, any suggestions on wording for the same and similar for going from Camboot to Ritchie? Great question. And we did a webinar on that last year, um, which is on that page Sarah was just on. And then we've developed some documents, which she just opened. So yes. And uh, there's the webinar. Mm -hmm. That's Sarah pulling out her hair. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> because same and similar. The same webinar is, so it's on the billing and coding page, but it's also on the webinars page. Yeah, so um, same and similar. Uh, will make you pull out your hair. Now, the good news with that is it's 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 uh, specific to Medicare patients, and most of us realize the majority of patients we treat for an ankle sprain are not Medicare beneficiaries, um, and so happily you don't have to deal with same and similar. But if you put a Medicare patient in a walking boot after a severe ankle sprain, and then you wanna move them into any kind of ankle brace, even an L1906 off the shelf uh, ankle brace, you have to deal with same or similar because Medicare considers those two types of devices similar. On the other hand, you can bill Medicare appeal and Medicare has stated they will reimburse you for the, the second brace in this case, the Ritchie brace after a walking boot, if your um, medical uh, your medical record and your notes clearly document the necessity of why they needed to move out of a walking boot and why you moved them into a custom articulated AFO brace, and obviously there's many medical necessity items that you can document, and if you do so, and appeal any denial. Medicare has assured me in webinars I've attended with them, you, the practitioner, are duly eligible for reimbursement. So these are kind of the quick guidelines of how you go through avoiding same or similar denials. And we, uh, th this is a document that Sarah's pulled up right from our website. Yeah. Those are <laughs> all on the billing and coding pages. And then again, um, there's the webinar specifically to that matter on our webinars page. So, all right, those are all the questions. And look, exactly one hour. How much more perfect does it get? I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so um, just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Quick reminder: you will be able to find the recording of this of this presentation within the next 48 hours, both, let me move my little screen over, 
on the richiebrace.com. If you go to the richiebrace.com and go to the providers section, of course, um, you will find those tools under webinars. And then you can also head to, I've got stuff all over my screen. You can head to podiatrymeetings.com as well and go to our Practice Partner Academy archives. Oops, I clicked on the wrong button, but it's there, I promise. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Dr. Ritchie, is there anything else you wanted to close out with? Um, no, the recording will be available, as Sarah said, and um, any of you practitioners who want to reach out to me, uh, feel free anytime. Uh, there's a consultation page on the Ritchie Brace site where you can pose clinical questions to me, and I usually answer the request within uh, eight hours. So um, I'm always available to you. Awesome. And yes, we have um, the, where, oh, there it is. The last session that we did with Dr. Richie, what causes a flat foot deformity and does it always need treatment? So I recommend checking that one out as well. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. And we will be in touch with you to give you a heads up on our next session, which I believe is June 20th. So mark your calendars. We'll see you. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night.